we have these uh, opportunities, so to speak, all the time. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one way of looking at this, that if you, when you get conscious on a topic and, and knowledgeable, and then you say, decide that, well, this is part of my identity and my values, to really try to live those values, uh, yeah. I think we become happier. Yeah, I think so. Too. It becomes part of your identity mm. to to sense. And I, but I also think that most people realize something or understand something um, on an intellectual level, but they don't change their behavior towards exactly in any way. And uh, and this is the, this is what I mean with with with. Uh, Deciding with your wallet to actually put yeah. your money where your, your mouth, mouth is. is. Exactly. And, and, and it's, it's quite simple because we have these choices all the time. And, and it's one thing to talk about it. It's a quite different thing to do it. I mean, like, and, and one example now is like, okay, is it really relevant to get an electrical car? Or you could argue, I have, I, I've got one, you got one. Yeah. So you can argue, oh, you know, it's, it's not uh, CO2 neutral at all, blah, 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 or whatever it is. But I think fundamentally, we all can be part of shifting the fundamental mindset, culture, or dogma, so to speak, yeah. in a society. And it's it's that sort of compounding effect that really will count in the end. Yeah. So the journey needs to start somewhere. And it's a bit the same like the journey, AI journey. Now, the first model you deploy might not have a good return of investment in itself but it's the first step on a journey. Yeah. And I, I think again, that, um, well, one thing is that technology, technology grows exponentially, the speed of technology or the price of technology. Yeah. 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 Coach by slow. Yeah. And organizational change happens logarithmically. So (laughs) really slow and Mm -hmm at a great cost, there there is a great cost in, in organizational change or in behavior change at all, like we just talked about. And I think it's kind of the same, our to change our behavior costs much more than intellectually realizing something. And now in, in the energy crisis we're in now, all of a sudden, everyone wants to subsidize energy, which is crazy. It's not crazy to, to, alleviate the economy of, of households. That's not what I mean. The, the crazy part is subsidizing something that there's a shortage, shortage of, because if you subsidize something with low uh, supply, prices will just go up even more if you don't reduce consumption. So, so we need to, to subsidize, like not, not subsidized energy. We need to, to give money back in a way that's not connected to, to the consumption. And I think this, this is what decision science is in a way that to, to have some economical principles to, to your decisions and not create uh, incentives for bad behavior. What a perfect segue. I think I will use that as a segue to properly introduce you today, uh, Rasmus, and it's so great to have you here. Rasmus Thunberg, uh, Decision and Data Science Manager at Tetra Pak. We will unpack that title for sure. That's so interesting. Um, yeah, we knew we known each other for a while. I think when we started, one of my first experiences when we started off this podcast, you came out and gave me, a, you know, like feedback on, on something. And I said, oh, I really want to talk to you and understand better. Like, why did you like it or something like that? So remember that first yep. conversation we had? Definitely. And it's like, oh, we need to put the kids to bed. <laughs> and we will. Oh, we should probably talk for 10 minutes. And we, I think we ended up having a conversation for almost an hour. Uh, definitely. It was probably amazing. Probably more, yeah. And I remember why, why I, what one of the first episodes I, I I was choosing between watching the latest episode of the Mandalorian or this podcast. And I decided to go for the podcast. Uh, <laughs> and now that makes me just flattering us. All right, flattering, but also, yes. yeah. But I'm sure you watched the Mandalorian after I because did. it's I awesome. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's probably the best to come out of uh, the Star Wars universe so yeah. far. Yeah. You liked it too. Yeah. But uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, so, so that, that, 
that was one thing. And then what I also ha has appreciated or realized that we are sharing a couple, of, a lot of ideas on how things work or why they, they don't work. The importance of community um, is has been is things where we are thinking alike, and you have been taking a very active part in the Airplane Alliance, uh, the community of peers where we sort of work on data and AI ready practices, uh, you know, between different companies, mm -hmm. and that's been extremely valuable and uh, useful and appreciated by uh, in the meetups we've had and stuff like that. So let's come back yeah. a little bit to that. But um, but let's start, uh, you know, a little bit. Uh, who, who are you, Rasmus, like uh, to start from that angle? Yes, uh, I would say I'm not super interesting. I, I mean, <laughs> so, so let's not spend too much time on that, but uh, a little bit. Uh, so I'm um, I was actually born here in Stockholm, um, raised on uh, Valmdö, mm -hmm. but moved to Skåne when I was five. So, and uh, lived in Skåne from the age of five. And now no one would be able to tell I have roots in Stockholm. <laughs> <laughs> and I live at Värmdö now. Yeah. That's pretty funny. Whereabouts in Värmdö, I must ask you. Do you remember? Oh, could oh it be? very close, okay. close by to where I live. Uh, so, and uh, then my, my, my cousins moved into the house and lived there throughout. And it was felt kind of strange to have your cousin living in my house <laughs> <laughs> when you were a kid, you don't. So you, get, you got to go back to them to visit your... Uh, I did, but then they moved on to yeah. central Stockholm or disappeared from Thunder. But um, I'm, I'm happy to live in Skåne. I think it's... It's a great part of Sweden, apart from the winters, which are, which sucks to be honest. Uh, but um, otherwise, I, I really like it down there. And do you live close to Lund now? I live in Lund. You live, I live in Lund. Lund. I, uh, I, I grew up in different places, but mostly in Rydbeck, south of Helsingborg, yeah. by the sea. So I lived by the sea all my life, I, and I. I spent my summers sailing uh, for, and now I have lived, uh, live in Lund away from the sea. And it's strange still after 20 years <laughs> living in Lund, not living by the sea. Yeah. And then, and then you did your university yeah, in, in Lund. Lund. That's yeah. why I ended up there. So, so I, uh, I, I decided on, uh, for, for the longest time, I thought I would study chemistry, become a, civil engineering chemistry or uh, engineering chemistry, maybe it's called, um, until the third grade in, uh, high school, gymnasium. Gymnasium. Uh, and, uh, then I st stumbled upon uh, organic chemistry and decided, no, this is not for me. <laughs> and, um, uh, was a bit, uh, hesitant. what should I do now with my life? And, um, uh, so, so I decided to go for a technical uh, engineering physics, technics physics, um, because that didn't close any doors for me. Um, and so, so I, I studied uh, engineering physics in uh, Lund, but I also uh, studied uh, philosophy and psychology on top yeah. of that. Interesting of my, combination. Yeah, wish I've studied something, then it would be Philosophy and psychology, actually. Uh, so, yeah, that's not too late. Yeah. It's not. No. But yeah, interesting. Um, so, uh, and I, I think it's been really helpful. Philosophy had a rumor of being um, a bit fluffy or hand wavy, but I think it's uh, the opposite, and yeah. it's been really helpful in structuring think, stru helping me structure thinking uh, properly. You have a favorite uh, philosopher? Uh, I, have, I have a few. Um, I'm fairly fond of uh, Bertram Russell, um, even though he tried to spend uh, half his career proving that two plus two is four. <laughs> um, I don't know him. Can you? He's a British philosopher, um, but. Uh, I don't want to go into details. It's okay. a, it's been so long. I probably would uh, end up saying something that's completely wrong. <laughs> um, but uh, also, I it's uh, it's where I 
to start thinking uh, about what we just talked about before, um, putting my money where my mouth is, mm. um, and while studying mo moral philosophy. And I mean, if, if I, if you come to the point where you can't argue for what you do, you should stop doing it. You should. I agree. But it's hard. It's, it's easy hard. To, it's, it's hard easy to say, hard to do in, in exactly. every facet. Yeah. So, and, and now, curious, when did you get onto the path of data science or, or data? Uh, it's been a long and meandering route. Uh, I, I started out the... Uh, working in a, within quality, supplier quality in, in a semiconductor manufacturing and semiconductor manufacturing is a really data driven industry. Mm. Uh, or the, the probably the first adop adopters of a statistical process control and understanding the data of their process properly and, and using it to guide decision making. And then we wanted to implement that. So, so that, that was when I was working at Sony Ericsson building mobile phones. So was, was that one of the first jobs? Out of, out of yeah, that was my first job after university. And, um, I was, that was a great, um, place to, to start your work life because it was a very young, very ambitious and very sophisticated workplace. Uh, I, I, I would say it's, uh, was, it was world-class, at least the parts I saw, uh, I haven't seen any, anything like it since in the terms of, uh, being professional and fast paced. And what, what are you, what are you sort of reflecting on as like a difference to how you, what you thought they were doing in a very professional and excellent way? They were very early on being fact-based and data-driven mm -hmm. and also having a, a, a very early on in, uh, in, uh, CSR, mm -hmm. um, so, so corporate social responsibility thinking and also making sure supply, the supply base was, uh, um, uh, taking care of the workers properly. So, so I've been, when, when I went and visited the, the, the suppliers, we always had, had a dual, uh, role, one where we checked out the production, but also how worker welfare, um, I remember checking out, uh, fire, fire, uh, extinguishing uh, equipment to make sure it worked. And it was in China and things were missing. And we went to the dorms and checked out how they lived. And uh, no one had ever done that before. And it caused big commotions, <laughs> kind of funny. Uh, but uh, then Apple had a lot of problems in this era, right? Uh, where uh, workers committed suicide in the production line, not in the line, obviously, but the working factory. there, yeah. yeah, working there. Um, so, so I, that felt very good to, to do that, but it also made me realize that there is uh, a grayscale, right? Where they don't live like we do. So we, we can't expect them to live like we do, but there's still a minimum standard that we can accept. Um, so. So, so you worked at Ericsson and then uh, here, then you had like different roles that have been going more and more into data. You yep. were with Eon, risk analyst over at Eon for a while. And then at as a boy. Value engineering. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, uh while uh, with systems engineering at the uh, ESS. Let's, 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 uh, could we dig in a little bit to what is value analysis and value engineering? Because I think this is one of the topics that as a methodology has been around for quite a long time, but I think it's maybe more important than uh, talked about in 2022 than I've heard it for many, many years. And I can quote Bill Schmarso, uh, one, of, one, one of the guys I like to discuss and argue with on LinkedIn. And he, he has this storyline around, you know, when you go to go from value engineering to data engineering to uh, analytics engineering and back again, like the we like, and really pushing the whole, whole idea that the whole community run data and we need to really wake up and go value first. And what is that all about? So in this context, I've been now 
getting uh, into value engineering and what it what it really means. So it's quite cool when you done that sort of as, as, as a role quite, you know, 10 years ago. Yeah. So yeah. what is it? It's, it's a systematic approach to cr value creation. Um, and you can use it for products or processes or um, bis I mean, business processes uh, or, or uh, any context where you, where you create value and it's to, to figure out how, how do we increase value? And then value could be defined, at least defined by function divided by cost. Mm -hmm. And so you can increase value by reducing cost. I mean, increasing efficiency or uh, redesigning a product to cost less, but provide the same function uh, without losing quality. So, and then the question is what's quality? <laughs> and what is value? And right? what's value? Yes, exactly. exactly. So, uh, and... But it, but in essence here, there, there is, there's a method, there's methodology to it here. So you have a structured approach to actually, as, as a framework, to sort out what is value and then sorting out. Yeah. Uh, and it really comes down to having all the business stakeholders or the value stakeholders in this case involved. Or, And if you can't have the customer in there, you need to have a proxy for the customer, mm. a very strong voice of the customer in any such uh, workshop or uh, value identification session or what you, whatever you would like to call it. And then you dissect the whole value chain or the product and figure out how can we, what is the function of this? What's, how does this contribute to value? Mm. And if it doesn't contribute to value, you figure, can we remove it? Yeah. Or, or yes, yeah, it, it does have a value. Okay. Then, uh, can we improve on that value? Can we increase the functionality? So, so how, how do you decide what to prioritize them if you take a value engineering approach to it? Who decides, you know, what's most potentially valuable? Is it that you listen to the stakeholders or, or who? who no, really you, you can't ask the stakeholder directly often yeah. because they, they are stuck in their reality. Yeah. Uh, and we mentioned uh, Elon Musk and first principle thinking before. So, um, so, so let's soon come back to that, but you, you need to listen to what the business stakeholder says and his, uh, they're very carefully, but you also need to, to guide them to describe the value. You need to be help them to do critical thinking and arriving on the first principle of the value. Um, so I think this is the core, right? So it's very easy to get stuck in your old ruts or dogma, whatever you want to call it. But if you have a structured approach to dissect with the right questioning techniques, to dissect f all the way down to first principles, what is it that we're truly trying to, uh, you know, problem to solve? What yeah. is truly useful for the customer? So really, you know, engineering, you know, for the right amount of uh, features for the right problem solving at the right cost. Exactly. Uh, and to do that, you also, you, you kind of need to understand your customer very well and, and uh, their utility functions. Uh, so, and it, in our case where we are B2B, that's both a bit trickier and a bit easier depending because you don't have that many customers, but they are very heterogeneous. So not all of them have the same same uh, utility functions when it comes to, to uh, products or what's and, value for them. And how do you think value engineering or, or this approach, how, how does this relate to, for instance, design thinking, service design? I mean, like there's several different schools here that are trying to find a way to articulate what is the problem and what is the, what are we here to solve as a solution or as an offering or as a journey or whatever. Do you think they're related or do you think they're adding different perspectives to the same I, I think it's, I think it's mainly looking at the same problem from different perspectives. Mm. Uh, it's the same goal. It's just different approaches. And uh, if done right, probably you would come up with this very similar answer. And I think this is, in, in for me, in my journey in 2022, 
and I, I can quote myself on the keynote uh, Data Innovation Summit this year. I think I was standing there screaming, you know, <laughs> it was a little bit PC and, and, and like that. But I remember screaming, value, 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 value. We all need to be better at value in, in the tech roles we do. So relating it back now to our community and AI and all that, I think this is one of the core topics to be really good at extracting and defining you know, what is the value and ultimately then translating that into whatever we need in data and, and like that. So yeah, I think this yeah. is, for me, I think that's one of the missing pieces that we haven't been doing so well over the years. We've been very much enthusiastic with with our tech or, you know, as an industry. I, I don't know. How do you see this? Uh, no, I, I totally agree. And I think that's an example of where Ericsson went from, they w went for technology, right? Very technology focused instead of, uh, and, and when I say Ericsson, I mean Sony Ericsson in this case, mobile phone mm -hmm. development, great technology, great phones. Uh, but someone else came with the iPhone and we said, that will never work. Those screens will break immediately. Uh, this is really hard to do properly. Um, and we, we have investigated this technology thoroughly and it, they will crack immediately. And they did, of course. And then we said, uh, people will need to case them in, in big rubber shells or something. And, and they did, <laughs> and, and they were happy because we didn't understand the value properly. How do you keep that then? How do you actually, how are you able to invent things like the digital camera or the iPhone or these kind of more innovative solutions that it's not really possible to see the value of right now? Yeah. And here I, I think value engineering is not the answer because yeah. value engineering is an approach to, to uh, a, a traditional methodology uh, uh, where you apply it to. And in order to take these uh, uh, discrete steps uh, and being really innovative, uh, it, it's hard for an old company like Tetra Pak, where I work now, or uh, uh, any old industry who's focused on uh, on um, it's called production excellence or and being really efficient and you marginally tweak the process, don't want to be, do big changes because the return on investment will be very low. And instead you end up uh, becoming a fossil uh, in, in the case of Kodak, uh, exactly. you said digital yeah. camera. Uh, and the question is, how can you be both innovative yes. and and uh, have this focus on efficiency, which you need to have as a big company because otherwise you will bleed to death. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's more like right-handed or left-handed. You need to be ambidextrous, but how do you get there? Really hard, right? Really hard. And it's, um, it's a struggle. And, and being like we started up uh, the decision science team in Tetra Park, we started up as an internal um, startup. Uh, and I think that's one of the, ways to do it, maybe not the only one, but you need to come in with the, without the preconceptions of the industry and try to, to remake it from within, because I don't think it can be done from without, and it can't be done in the old structure. So, so there are so many topics here. Yeah, I'm just uh, so eager to, to just ask, you know, how do you do innovation at Tetra Park? But uh, we haven't even come to. No, so, so let's, let, let, let's just, uh, let's just wrap this up because I think we are, we are, we're coming into some real meat, mm -hmm. super good uh, topics and fun topics. But I mean, like, so, so I think that part of Asava Bloy, I think there's something there that is really useful to have done, but I think yeah. also very interesting to highlight value engineering is suitable in some context, but when you do want to do real innovation or uh, leapfrogging of some kinds, you know, there are other ways or other, other, yeah. other methods to consider. Like lean startup or. Yeah, clean similar. startup. Yeah. And, and we, we, yeah. we're going to, I'm going to park this now, but we come into this whole first principle discussion and we come into a favorite topic. I think I know with you together with me, 
hypothesis driven hypothesis yes. steering yeah Definitely. this is interesting right and this is also a big shift for the old company right yeah. but in so parking a couple of interesting topics here but but here you had a career and then you you worked in a couple of different uh, consultancies for yes. a while H- how would you say that was different to you experiencing being in like Asab Abloy or Eon and and Sony and then working in a consultancy both super liberating and super frustrating. Ah, good one. Elaborate, please. Yes. So the it felt so good to be able to concentrate on a focused topic. You had a you had a very clear project. task to solve, a, a project. project. Yeah, a project. And you could just do it without the the overhead of being in a big company. And you got happy stakeholders or customers in, um, when you delivered something good and hopefully in a, in a better time than they expected. And, and um, could, the, the connection with value was very clear then. Mm. Uh, and you saw impact immediately. But the frustrating part is that you then left your baby mm. and... You didn't know if it was used or at all. So, so you actually just assumed the impact. You had to assume the impact of yeah. what you did. Uh, otherwise you wouldn't make it <laughs> or at least not my, I, I, I really need to see the impact of what I do. And, and is that one of the reasons in the end that you sort of went uh, f- from consulting firms and started at uh, Tetra Pak? Yes, or? because I, I really missed being involved in the strategic decision-making and the uh, um, yeah, strat- strategizing, but also seeing things through, s- seeing things through and having the holistic view of the problem, because as a consultant, you're, you're again, a, or a feature delivery person or feature delivery team, you, someone else come up with a solution for you to build, and then you can b- build something within that framework. But, but that's not how you create value, uh, delivering features that you then leave and someone else takes over who doesn't really understand it. You need to, uh, I, Mark Kagan says you need to have, we need to have missionaries, not uh, mercenaries. <laughs> I love that. And, and I need to connect you with, um, Mikkel Klingvall at Derdax because we had today this conversation around the difference of the cycle of, you know, from value execution. This is, we have a product and we execute on this value. And this is where value engineering fits in, executing on the value we know. And then we get into more uh, uh, value creation. So thinking up something new, creating new values. And in the end, you can do a project where you have created value, but then you need it to move into value capture, mm. capitalization. So the core topic here is like we've done it, an algorithm or a model. In theory, it's great, but it's not worth any money yet until you're capturing that or capitalizing on that model and therefore re-engineering the core process of the people that are supposed to use it, yeah. even if it's the end customer or the internal customer. So for me, that's the same, you know, that, you know, as a consultant, you're very hard to get all the way into the value capture part. Yeah. Uh, and it, within Tetra Pak, we call it continuous value. You that's get need one. to get into continuous value mode. I love it. I love that. I love that term, continuous value mode. And so, so, um, do you remember sort of how was the recruitment into Tetra Pak? How did that happen? How did you get in there? I got a call. <laughs> um, actually I was in a, a recruitment process for a, for a different, uh, for McKinsey, I think it was, I don't remember, but I realized that won't work for me in my family situation, even though I was tempted at the time. Uh, but I, I then said, no, they, this won't work for me. And then they say, but we also had this other role at Tetra Pak. Could that be interesting? Oh, so, so then he connected me with my current manager, uh, Alberto Barroso. Mm. Um, and, uh, that kind of clicked. So, um, and you know, okay. So let's just now frame Tetra Pak a couple of minutes. What is Tetra Pak as a company? We, we know it, of course, as uh, one of the, you know, crown jewels in Sweden, in like uh, as an industrial global company. It's, it's, you know, but, but how would you, f- what is Tetra Pak as a company? 
Well, first of all, we have the main business, which is the packaging business. But then there, were, there is also a food processing part mm-hmm. where with lots of food processing equipment. Um, and then, of course, there is the service part. But the processing part of the business is also world-class. For example, we, we have uh, at least 50% of the ice cream market in the world. Oh, um, really? So one, when you buy a Magnum, the, the stick... Yeah. That says Magnum, that's a Tetra Pak product. So basically what you're saying is that you, I mean, like uh, for see, the packaging business, as I understand it, is that you, in, in a sense, sell industrial or setups or plants for packaging that someone will use as part of their pr- production for yeah, so, a product. So we build full dairies or a uh, juice production facilities or a tomato, crushed tomato production facilities from so not from only the packaging but the whole whole factory from we, we greenfield projects uh, so someone calls us design design a factory for us and build it and so literally raw material is is uh, uh, tomatoes here yeah. and then coming uh, to the door into the factory you have built and out comes the tetra pack with the uh, uh, tomato, crushed tomatoes, crushed tomatoes. Yeah. The or tomato thing. sauce or yeah so it's actually uh, a lot of processing going on here not only packaging yep uh, i and i would say that the, the processing parts it's it's in value it's not as big but uh, on a it, we we are huge on a global basis uh, in uh, the full processing equipment part as well yeah because it's easy to understand Tetra Pak from afar that oh, these are that they are the guys with the triangular <laughs> like this, yeah. package that you know you I think that's a it's called a classical Tetra Pak the yeah. old festis or the old milk yeah. uh, and that that's the basis of the name of Tetra Pak yeah. for for tetroid yeah. Yeah. yeah and um, and and then not realizing no 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 that's just one part of the whole story here. But, but a, a but a very important part as well. I mean, uh, and the mission of Tetra Pak is to provide safe food everywhere. Ooh, good one. And uh, uh, and uh, in many senses, we're a value-driven company. But uh, following your values is some sometimes hard uh, because we we have a global presence, obviously, and now with the war in Russia. We have a dile- dilemma that our values of providing safe food clashes with the values of, of uh, standing up against oppression uh, and uh, boycotting Russia. Um, so, so for example, is, is it fair for babies not to receive uh, safely packaged food uh, just because the leadership? Uh, have have decided to go to war with another country. It's not an obvious choice to to divest in in Russia, which we have done now. But uh, yeah, you took a lot of heat for being slow on that yeah, uh, yeah. decision. I remember that. Uh, but uh, it's I, a hard I, one. It's a very hard it, one because again, it it's being value driven and having a mission to create deliver safe food for everyone. That that seems like an easy thing to do, right? Without uh, any any consequences, but it it does have. Um, but I think I think it's important to be value driven. Um, yeah, but and and let's let's dive in a little bit, like to uh, how does data science or analytics or AI machine learning manifest itself? A Tetra Pak, like how, you know, what is it? What typically is this all about for Tetra Pak? Yeah, uh, I will speak mostly for my division, the decision science team. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we have other data scientists working within Tetra Pak, uh, within automation or within, uh, um, yeah. Several, uh, so, there, so there are different use cases in different parts of different problems to be with data science, but you're working in one of them. Yeah, I'm working in one of them. And I would say the biggest one, but uh, it's not the only one. And 
our mission is to improve decision making with the help of data. Uh, and improving decision making is very wide. So it means both uh, innovating with the business processes, but it also means optimizing our customers' uh, process. Uh, production processes, because that's also decision based. You decide on on uh, how to set your production, uh, and a decision really is comes down to a choice. You need to make a couple of choices to optimize an outcome, and that's what we mean by decision decision science. So, was this a a um, conscious choice to talk about decision science versus data science? Yes, and. We, we started out as the data science center of excellence, like very generic term for an internal startup group. Uh, but we quickly realized that in order to get to value, we need to, to focus on decision making because it's the decision making that creates value. It's information doesn't create value. And um, it, I would say it's decision followed by action that creates value, right? So, um, so, so we really focus on uh, being, doing prescriptive analytics uh, and not only providing a descriptive or uh, forecasting the predictive uh, analytics. It's not always, I mean, that clear cut, but we, we have that as our uh, vision to, to always get to the prescriptive parts of optimizing decision making. So <clears throat> would you say that the data science, at least in your team, is mainly focused on more BI purposes or is it also being used like in products itself or is it is it mainly BI? No, I would say neither <laughs> because, uh, well, BI may be in its broadest sense, but BI tends to be about uh, uh, descriptive and it's and talking about what was while we try to be forward looking and uh, saying, given the trends we see, what is our best options? What, how, sh what should we decide? But it, it's basically helping the decision makers at least yes. in yes, what decision to take true. from a more uh, company overall perspective in some sense. I would say that that's our major focus right now. And that's where the majority of continuous value comes from. But I think this is also interesting because of course now you have different teams who are using algorithms in, in different purposes. So you highlighted as there was another team that's working on automation type topics. And here we have another type of machine learning and AI coming into sort of monitoring and, and making automated operational decisions mm -hmm. in, in the production flow. And, you know, you're incorporating algorithms into your core uh, products you sell, so to speak, in the in building a plant and stuff like that. But that's a different. That's that's not where you are, so to speak. Yes, uh, uh, we do dabble in in production optimization, uh, but production as in manufacturing or or, or uh, no, our customers' production. Oh. So uh, we we have cases where we're trying to help our customer to uh, optimize the yield, uh, optimize yield based on in input. Um, so they, they get more predictable outcomes, more, uh, better quality outcomes as well. Yeah. Maybe yeah. explain yield because that's, yield, a, yeah, uh, that's obvious for you and for the ones <laughs> who knows production, but not for everyone. So based on how much you put in, you maximize the amount you get out of the process. Yes. Yeah, so we can talk so. about, we should have hundred units produced out of this raw material. We only get 90 because we have so much faulty. So we need to, inc we need to improve our yield. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, and your customers in this case is what? In this case, it's a, a dairy kind of, I don't want to discuss this specific project, uh, no. but a, it's yeah. a, in the dairy space. Yeah. Um, so, so, so if, if, if we take, I'm not saying there are customers, but I'll take example customers for what it could be. In Sweden, we have a, a dairy producer. The name is Arla in Sweden. Yeah. We all have drink Arla milk. They have massive manufacturing plants, of course, to produce that milk and to ship it and all that into our stores. And potentially they could use Tetra uh, production value chain or production setup yeah. uh, in there. And ultimately then when we're talking about yield is in relation to food processing here. Yeah. 
Is that a summary? Yes, yes, it's a good summary. And and uh, in this case, the, the, there is also a yield loss in terms of uh, of uh, aseptic performance. I mean, uh, bacteria or something grow, starting growing with, within the product, and that's also something we look into how, how to increase uh, our aseptic performance. Um, by by optimizing cleaning cycles or other uh, production parameters. So, so I think this is I think tetrapack in this way is super interesting because there are many things here that sort of sometimes we forget how much data and data science there is in in, in large scale B two B type business. It's so easy to talk about the Spotify cases or the Klarna cases where it's sort of oh it's operational and it's happening uh, with a, a simple to a grasp one consumer and here we're talking about industrial scale selling of big manufacturing plants and you have sales cycles for maybe years all this right multiple years multiple case, years yeah. and then basically how to work with data and fa- data driven approaches in this context is equally relevant but it's not the same no it's definitely not the same i i would say argue it's much harder but very important uh, because, as I said, we, we have less customer, but more heterogeneous customers, meaning you can't apply the same solution to everything. So you really need to understand your uh, business domain or customer domain mm. uh, and not t- treat all your customer equally. Uh, and that is, of course, how we tend to to act, uh, especially in, in old businesses. We, we come up with... Uh, uh, a standardized strategy or, or a way of working. And we, we say we all, every customer is equally important or things like that, but being really customer focused is treating customers differently. Not that all, every customer is the king. And let's go into this a little bit because this has been on my mind uh, for years. Um, you know, I think it's easy, you know, Okay, entry point into the topic. Why is it Facebook or companies like that that has that are at the cutting edge frontier of, of using AI and machine learning on really large scale and operational? And I heard someone, I'm gonna test this with you now, arguing that, well, one of the things that make that possible is that the fundamental data model around a customer or, or like, or if I take a Spotify, it's fairly framed compared to when you go into a, 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 a you know, like some type of multi-agent system, like building a, a full production plant, or I talk about, um, one example is bullying or mining and looking at a mine as a system, mm-hmm. like the ontology of this and the understanding of that is used mind-blowingly much harder. So therefore, it's been a r- really hard to start understanding how can we learn from the cutting edge and how can we now think about applying that in, in, in with, this, with the same goal of outcomes, I think, but very di- we, the, the route there is quite different. I mean, like, so I've been on, I've been thinking about the B2B versus direct to consumer and all that, that it, there is sort of, the, the, we can learn so much from each other, but it's also very different. Yes, yes, definitely. So a concept like customer lifetime value, mm. very different, right? In, in the B2C and the B2B space. Yeah. Um, and uh, now we re- that's something we haven't cracked yet, uh, but uh, because of, of the heterogeneity of our uh, customer base, we, I mean, we have all from small, small uh, dairies in, in Brazil to Oatly. Arla here in Sweden or Coca-Cola yeah. to be, go even bigger. The, those are not the same kind of, uh, bis- they don't have the same kind of business problems almost, even though they work in the same uh, business space. Obviously. Yeah. So, so what has been your journey to, to think about data science and, you know, in this B2B context, you know, how, how have you sort of gone into it? I think. So what, what, what we try to do is we try to go for the value, right? <laughs> where figure out where is the value, uh, and by understanding our business models and understanding where we have waste, 
in terms of uh, of uh, stock, staying around safety stock optimization costs a lot, uh, obviously. Um, but also production optimization, where when the product, production planning, I should say. Um, and as, as you said, we have very long sales cycles. How we, we so that means we have a very costly sales cycle. We spend a lot of money in pre sales mm. uh, with pre sales engineers uh, designing plans and stuff uh, without with the expectation of selling, but not the guarantee. And then that uh, if we want to make a lot of bets, we need to quantify those bets in order to, to improve decision making. And that's something we have been working a lot with quantifying the sales bets, for example, by, by understanding the probability of selling and the time to sell and stuff like that. So I think what you are saying here is go back to understanding where is the waste, where is the value, where is the, what, what problem is useful enough to solve, so to speak, yeah. and then start applying data science, understanding what, what, what are data science or data related questions here that we can basically improve what we can do here. Yeah. And then you dissect, dissect, uncover, peel. Exactly. And it goes back to first principle thinking again. Uh, uh, and uh, trying to figure out uh, not how we work, but how could we work if we had better information? Mm. And how could we then take better decisions than we did today? So, so the, we, we try to both do the small gradual improvements, but also the big innovative steps. Um, and, and elaborate a little bit like how you see first principle thinking in this context now, because I think this is really. So, so going back to the sales process, that could mean that, uh, I mean, to really understand what, what is the basic principle of a sales opportunity? What are the components uh, uh, or w where are the uncertainties in, in that sales process? And uh, where do we spend time um, in the sales process? How, how, how d is the cost distributed throughout that? And how can we do that differently? Um, instead of, of looking how, how do we actually do it today? Uh, but for, it's a, I, I, I am realize I am not very clear now, but, <laughs> but it's, yeah. but let me try, uh, at a lunch, me and Goran, help me out here a little bit, Goran. And we were talking actually, so this is a gen general B2B sales, uh, realization where I think what you're on to is first principles. So we said like, okay, customer X has been super successful selling something of quite large magnitude to customer A. So, uh, uh, sorry, supplier X to customer A. And then we realized, well, what was the context of this situation when this sale went through? And then Goran, you made a very good um, analogy. You were talking about like, like a chemist major, if, if you set up an experiment and you need to basically. I thought you were talking about today. So I was wondering like, when did we spoke about? No, this is a couple of weeks back, a couple <laughs> of weeks back. Mm -hmm. No, so the interesting thing is like, if you have an, a chemical experiment and you want to, to reproduce that con success, you know, you need to control your environment. You know, you need to understand what is the context where this uh, chemistry experiment will work. So you may, I think you made it really sharp, this analogy, like what is the environment where these sales of these complex sales will take place now? And what are the ingredients yeah, in the so, environment where this will work so, or not work? So basically the discussion was like, okay, if you have successfully made a sale of a product or a service, the first one, right? And now you want to duplicate that success the chances of you succeeding with that sale will be if you have a similar um, environment where the buyer is the same, the challenge of the person is the same, the objective of the person is the same, and the hinder of the person is the same. And then comes the budget, decision-making, and etc. 
So the chances of you duplicating the success is like in an experiment, right? You have successfully done it once. Let's say in chemistry, that would be pressure, temperature, uh, quantity of uh, items and et cetera. It's the same thing in sales, right? So more times you execute the same type of experiment, more successful you are. And then when you are successful in that, you can actually start in removing some of those or adding other materials or maybe hiring the temperature and et cetera, whatever it is. Therefore, you can be successful in creating other opportunities. But the analogy was that in order for you to duplicate the success, easiest is to find the same environment as the first cell. And and this is how I is now what this is linking back to the conversation now and doing the decision science on this is a little bit like well it's you can start understand if you start understanding the environment and what is the decision criteria what is the qualification model so to speak of this B two B sales opportunity do you know that certain things need to have happened and be in place for this to to have a chance to succeed. So I think you can talk about life expectancy of this deal and stuff like this, right? Exactly. Because you see, well, you haven't given the, this, you haven't got the sponsor, you haven't got a clear budget decision. You have, there's fundamentals of s- survival for this organism, the deal. So the life expectancy of this deal is quite low right now. Is that right. a fair? Yeah, sort of yeah, it is. Uh, and you, you can also say, hello, we, we have seen that if, if it doesn't, Evolve that there is nothing happening with the sales. The probability of it surviving goes down. It's freshness, right? right? It's fresh right. milk. Deals are like milk. They, they need to be fresh. <laughs> Longer shelf life though. <laughs> Three years. But, um, but yes, uh, and also coming back to, to, uh, then what, why, why do we need the help of machines to do this? Because uh, machine learning, uh, ML or uh, statistical models uh, are less prone to be be biased or noisy. You, because if you, if you read Kahneman, you yeah. know uh, definitely knows about cognitive biases, mm. which I mean humans are really bad decision machines. Uh, in most cases, in in, in uh, situations where we are familiar or have some kind of expertise, we can be really good and have aut- uh, heuristics for for handling situations. But in new situations that or situation that doesn't happen often enough for us to learn, we will never develop expertise. And thus, our gut feeling will not be aiding us in our decision making. Um, Using models, even though they are based on what you already know, they they will be much less likely to have a bias because that can be easily controlled and removed from from the process from from the model. But also, it's less likely to have a noise noise in the context of, of uh, you are not taking the same decision on one week after. Another, even though the context is exactly the same. So, or in the case of, of uh, Goran's uh, customer, exactly the same circumstances, and the customer could take a different decision uh, because he woke up uh, on the wrong side of the bed. Uh, and that, that's more decision noise, uh, which haven't been talked about so much now, but uh, um, yet. But I, I see this as a big topic coming up uh, since uh, Kahneman now wrote a book called Noise, which is excellent and everyone should read it. Yeah. So he, he, he's uh, type one, type two thinking, thinking fast, thinking slow Uh, was was his first book. And now he has noise. Noise. Yeah. Uh, And uh, I think uh, thinking fast and slow was a huge hit, but it's, to be honest, it's a bit hard to read because uh, uh, he, he, he wrote it uh, alone, I think. Uh, anyway, he didn't have the same help he has, have now in, in noise, which are, uh, he, he, he learned from the f- first book to, so it's much easier to digest. Uh, and it's m- just as important for decision makers to understand or everyone who, who um, 
works in this space needs to understand the concepts of noise, the different kind of decision noise and different kind of uh, decision biases. So how would you describe it? What is the core message of noise? Uh, use machine learning. <laughs> but it's not no. the only way. I mean, there must be situations where machines are good yes. and, and also bad. And yeah. the same with humans, right? Uh, a typical example of where, uh, a typical example where humans are, can outperform machines is uh, if you're trying to predict an outlier, uh, humans are much better at understanding how an outlier will act or take decision around uh, uncommon cases. For example, if I were to predict uh, if uh, Henrik is going to the movie tonight, um, I could uh, probably be like model, a statistical model based on that. But if you know he has broken leg, uh, you, you have information that's really important uh, that the model will never be able to take into account or never. But that, that kind of things that you as human need to override the the machine learning model but you if you use the machine learning model as a baseline for decision making and then you take broken legs into account and override uh, so the conclusion basically is that you should um, combine machines and humans together yes definitely uh, and another example is uh, today with driving here um, i uh, i used uh, google maps to guide me and uh, most of the way, I didn't use it because I felt uh, confident on on yeah. driving. But coming into Stockholm, I I realized I'm lost without uh, this uh, decision help I have. And um, but I I had to override it to to uh, because of the uh, road work that wasn't on the map, and I took a different road. Um, so if you were I to try to, I mean. We've spoken about this a bit before, but what, what are really, do you have a nice way to frame just what are machines good at and what are humans good at? Uh, I have my favorite way to describe it, but do you have a favorite way? I, I think you, I would say uh, machines are, are good at all the common cases. Uh, so if, if you have something that, that repeats, use a machine for it. If it, if it's uh, just one-offs or outliers, uh, use your uh, human human uh, decision-making skills. Uh, of course, there's also a co cost-benefit uh, analysis to make. I mean, uh, most decisions are not that important. We make millions of decisions and most of them doesn't count at all. Uh, and for those, you use your uh, heuristics. Right. Uh, could we could we dive a little bit deeper on so now in this type of uh, decision uh, science what, what techniques are we talking about both statistical and and technically and you know what's the math or what's the systems behind here what are you doing concretely so for, first of all in order to build a, mach a machine learning model you need a record of historical decision making mm -hmm. and uh, that's where the problem starts. Uh, because Tetrapack, like many other companies, don't record their decision making. They record results uh, the, or outcomes. But unless you know the information at the point of the decision, so the available information at the decision time and the decision taken, it's really hard to build a model. <laughs> based on that. So, so uh, many examples of uh, models, uh, decision-making models are based on, uh, on well-documented decisions like uh, court cases uh, where a lot of data is available and the decision is documented. But uh, but in business that it doesn't work like that. Uh, uh, at least so you not have yet. To start building up your win loss. Exactly. I mean, like, so uh, as an example, if if a company has been doing very elaborate win loss analysis, have been capturing this data, this is a huge benefit. For yeah, that's a gold mine. Yeah. And again, yeah, people say data is the new oil. I don't really agree because oil is have a high potential value always, right? Or or at least still. Um, 
I think it's more like data is new, new uh, uh, ground where it's so, sometimes you can dig into it and find gold. Sometimes it's just dirt. And, uh, it, and that also has uses, but you need to find the right use for the right data. And what I'm think I'm talking about is, uh, being, having a data centric approach because, uh, modeling isn't, it's just a tool for, for finding patterns. It's the data that's important. We need to collect the right data for the right problems. So I like you had that to actually debunk, you know, the horrible, uh, <laughs> metaphor of da data is a new oil because that's, I think it's wrong for so many reasons. Yeah. And, and one of them is what you said, data is certainly not always good or mm. useful. But also oil is, you know, for one, really bad for our environment. Data is not necessarily so. No. Oil is uh, finite. And data is, is not, right? So I think it's a really horrible metaphor, if I, I say so. I agree. We need to come up with a better one. <laughs> yes. So, so why is it not a good metaphor again? Because there's so many wrong things with it. I mean, yeah, for one... But, uh, I mean, the first one that you mentioned, if that was not the oil, we would not be entering the industrial age, right? It would be much harder to do this on a cook on a, on a boiling water. Everything yeah, so, so it, uh, it, it, it was an yeah. excellent energy source until we used it yeah, too but much. It, yeah. it made its purpose. It was a part of uh, innovation. And the second one, what was the second one? <laughs> I mean, it's many things. For, for one, you know, it's bad for our climate, All right, which is okay. not necessarily, and, and it's finite. And it's also sometimes bad, as you said, you know, mm -hmm. data, if you compare it to the ground, as you say, that's more, I think, apt and, and more correct. And I think the data is a new el electricity is actually more proper. Mm -hmm. And and yeah. can be. More but, uh, I, let, but let I, me let me take so, it. So let let me argue yeah, on this so, one a little so bit. My background is a chemical engineering, yeah. right? Okay. And you can do so many stuff with the oil, right? Yeah. You take the oil; it's not clean, it's dirty. There is so many things in that oil. Hmm. So first, you need to clean it, data mining, data cleaning. Yeah. Then you decide what you want to do with it. Do you want to do a petroleum? Do you want to do benzene? Do you want to do kerosene? Do you want to do plastic? Do you want to do rubber? Do you want to do and then basically you optimize the entire to excellence. So in the end, when you're done with a one kilo of oil, you have left zero, right? Of uh, other stuff. Now, in contrary to what I said right now, if I have to say, then we had this discussion also on the same lunch with, uh, with uh, Hendrik. The problem with the oil is that when you have taken one liter of crude oil and you have transformed it to something, you cannot take it back. The oil, the data, it's basically when it comes, it can stay, it can be kept as a metadata, as a, as a master data, raw data, or raw data and et cetera. So you can repurpose it. So from that analogy, yes, I would agree. But I think that oil was a very good analogy at the beginning because you had the refinery, you had a transportation of the data, you had usage, you had like a sales point, you had like a stat oils, you had everything around it, which was basically everything from collection to distribution, to selling, to usage, to repurposing. Can you say well. the same about electricity then? And that yeah, would be you much more. You cannot say like data is like electricity. You can, and people have. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. Let, let me have a completely different angle on data is the new oil. And I actually used that myself very loosely, and then someone else used it. So I, I first of all, I agree that to work with data as the new oil in, in its full literal sense, I see a lot of problems with that, as, as you pointed out, Anders. Mm -hmm. But um, one argument I heard is, well, when it was used originally and, and in the economist uh, five, six years back, they were not referring to data as the new oil in its literal sense. So it's been completely wrong. You know, the, the argument that you have f is, is then the one to put forward. Let, let, let me finish. Mm -hmm. So the whole argument comes about of understanding the economical shift of power that happened in the economy uh, uh, with the Rockefeller era and they coming in and dominating the world. So when we say data is the new oil in, those, in the sense it was mentioned in The Economist and that I've been argued by guys like Bill Schmarzo, it's, an, it's, it's from an economical sense and it's actually a description of the AI divide. 
It's mm. a description of what happens when the very few has the, has the uh, resources uh, of have has the raw material at this at their disposal that all all the rest of the world is needing. So so in that sense, data is the new oil for me. Is for me to understand the fundamental economical impact that data has and how much we can learn from the industrial era and how oil created wars, how oil created this divide in the world between the haves and not haves and the, between the exploited and not and the exploit, uh, exploiters. Yeah. So for me, data as the new oil is actually an economic, for me, I understand it from an economical and I, sense. I see what and, you mean. And of course, it's not a horrible uh, analogy, but I think there are better ones. Um, no, but of course, you can find similarities between them. I mean, still, someone said uh, data still. is the new sun. Maybe data is the new sun. Is, I mean, like the, the, but I, I, I think we people have misunderstood. That is and actually misused. better than the electricity because we're, how the electricity is coming. So where is it coming from? How do you use it? Um, transportation. Yeah, but, uh, you have to find for, a way to find for data me, as well. And you but need but, to find but ways for me, it's electricity. It, yeah. It's the fundamental right. understanding. You cannot peel it down. You cannot make different things with it, right? I mean, you can. You it's, can transform it, but can. you. The oil is great because it's dirty. You clean it. The same is the dirt. In the dirt, you have gold. Yeah, you have like a clay. You have like a dolomites and all of this other stuff. But, 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 but it's the fundamental flaw to me with data is the new oil is that data has the unique um, feature of it, it is appreciating in value if you do it right. Mm. So it's one of the few... Uh, you know, raw materials that appreciate if you if you do it right. I mean, like if you um, if you know more and more, and if you're grooming your data and you add more to it, it appreciates in value. Uh, you, I mean, like if you have many different raw mat- uh, raw data that you have in no context, in no meaning, has little value. If you if you put it together, it has more value potentially, right? So uh, it's an infinite resource that is appreciate has it's a not dana- infinite, but yeah. not infinite. If you're speaking about oil or you're speaking no, about data. No, data, data. Oh, okay. So I data, see. I mean, yeah, like, yeah, so, so the real flawed argument with oil yeah. is that it's not appreciating in value in the same way. Sure. But but I, I think there is something to what you said that oil was the motor of the industrial revolution, like, or even coal before it. Yeah. I think coal was even a bigger shift than the oil was, but coal was maybe more readily available globally uh, and not and didn't lead to centralization like the Rockefeller era. But, but I also think, I mean, what, what oil did is it replaced human work, uh, like, uh, from, uh, manual work. Uh, you could turn oil into manual work and can turn, and we can turn data into cognitive work. Yeah. Sense. So, so for me, the data is the new oil it needs to be understood in this context of economics that we said, and then how the oil was part of the automation of muscle power mm. versus and data in the new era is the, a new economical factor that is about automation of brain power. Mm. So if you, if you, so, so, so I think there are, there are things here that the sort of, I don't think. You cannot literally use it. I, I don't like that. I, then I agree with Andes, in fact. I, I quite hate it. But if you think about it from a macro perspective and discuss this on a macro perspective, there's a hell of a lot to be learned around the AI divide and what the hell we are doing now. Mm-hmm. That is quite concerning that people are not really understanding what how, what is happening around them. That's my take yeah, on this. I'm sure. I mean, there are good examples and analogies you can make. I, I still think, you know, electricity had a much bigger impact on our in- industry than, than oil had, but we can yeah. argue that later. Perhaps. Yeah, you can, no, you no, can no. do electricity <laughs> out of oil. Yeah. Yes. You um, cannot do electricity uh, oil out of electricity. Yeah, no, you which can, is good, you can right? actually. Because you actually, don't yeah. want to have oil. Why not? Uh, you, <laughs> could, you could potentially, you know, compress <laughs> things with yeah. electricity to I actually mean, produce oil. Just so, because it's yes, wrong good. right now. It was <laughs> right 100 years ago, 200 years ago, right? <laughs> All right. Um, this is more of an after after work. So, yes, 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 yes. so, so um, we are moving into some general topics here. And I think there is a segue here, some in between topics be, 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 before we go down to all, all the, the macro perspectives. I would like to get your view on how do you understand 
eh, the critical success factors and blockers around succeeding with data science in an enterprise setting? Mm. This is the big question. When you have the answer, come back to me, but right. <laughs> let, let me try to answer it all as well. Um, I, I had a conversation with Sumil Gupta, who's been on, on the show yeah. uh, around really need, I mean, we, we use the uh, crisp DM as a process for starting our uh, projects. Um, and it starts with business understanding and data understanding step. Uh, and I think this is really core, regardless of how you work, you need to really understand your problem and what your assets are in order to, to be able to solve the problem. And in order to build a model, you only need to understand maybe the the decision challenge we're looking at, but in order to be successful then in implementing it, you need to understand the business context. You also need to understand the more commercial context. So you need to start by framing the commercial context, focusing then on, on the business context, and then zooming in on the decision context. And then you can start thinking about do I understand the problem properly? And do I have data to address this um, problem? And then we have a basis for, for uh, building something. I think so, so this critical success factor number one is you need to actually zoom out quite a bit in order to really get it right. Quite a bit, yeah. And, and I think uh, Sumil have put this really well by, by, by focusing on, on the big commercial framing yes. of it. And and, and I, I could then translate that critical success factors to one of our main issues and problems and, and blockers, because not only or always are we expected have the mandate to have the starting point to be able to drive it the way we want to do it. So we are sort of forced in to be pigeonholed to solve something here when we actually know we should start in a different way. Exactly. So, so what often happens is that someone have a very, uh, have a solution to a problem. They, so they want me to deliver the solution to their problem. This is the solution that, uh, it's a, a gradual improvement on what we're already doing. But without, if you don't so zoom out and ask what is the actual problem we're trying to optimize, we will never get to the real core of the, of, of value. And, and then use following the same argument. So now in order to frame the problem correctly, we have gone down this funnel, so to speak. Yeah. Now in order to, tr now we have built something that is sort of working here. Now the same problem remains to funnel out again to get to value capture. Yeah. So just because you have the right model, how do I make the right model into the right decision, into the right action, into the right result, where this now needs to be placed back mm. in the business context, in the broader commercial context, right? Right. And it, often it's the case that the business don't have the bandwidth to, to understand what you have built for them mm. because they are stuck in their current context and, and, uh, every could we be a bit more concrete? Uh, for me, as a non-business person, it would be fun to just hear, you know, what really do you mean the difference are between commercial context and business context and decision context, okay. etc. Yeah. And so, so by commercial context, I mean the wider world uh, in the... Could we have some example, perhaps, some yeah, example maybe, that can speak about that to just make it a bit more clear? Yeah, let, let, let's say uh, cheese production. Mm -hmm. uh, there is commercial context where how people buy cheese, how, how cheese is produced yeah. and how, um, uh, how Tetra Pak then provides value to the cheese manufacturer and, and what kind of problems are we solving for the cheese manufacturer today uh, and how, how can we commercialize it or monetize uh, our solutions, yes. uh, get paid for what we do basically. Right. Uh, and then the, the business context is more internally looking in, within our organization. Uh, 
uh, it, are we set up properly to address or uh, build something for our customer that we can sell? Do we have a business model for selling uh, outcome-based services? The for business example? model isn't that based on the commercial aspect. Is it more about you know how much work it would require you as a business to make this service or product work? I, it it's, could be that as well. Yes, but I, I think um, it's more like. Um, for me, the business context is more like Conway's law that you, you, you end up shipping your organizational charts, uh, while, while the, and, and the customer are not very interested in your organizational charts. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, we need to, to figure out, uh, how, how to maneuver within the business context, um, then you mean inside the company? Yeah, inside the company. So, yeah. so, so let me help you here because I had deep discussions on these topics with Somil yeah. as well. And we, we, we actually did a, an engagement with Grunfos on exactly these topics where, where the, the core example is a new innovation, cooling as a service. So basically mm -hmm. cooling is a major problem and basically actually amounts to a lot of CO2 right now. So if we can optimize coolings in, in buildings, it's a, it's a huge effort. Mm -hmm. And we, and, and Grundfos is genius. They have figured out a way to do that without changing the infrastructure of cooling towers, but optimize how you, how you operate it. Okay. So, so the commercial context now is basically, we can understand a problem, we can reduce CO2 and we can reduce so many things and we can make it cheaper for you. Mm -hmm. So now we have a, a commercial thing that flies on paper, right? And typically now you go in and you work with some consultants or you work in your innovation uh, and, and you, you start structuring and you call it a business model canvas. So the first attempt to understand the, the world life problem and how you can sort of understand the, the very gen general context of this is, is some sort of high fly business model canvas, you can call it. It's like a methodology tool to understand what are the core dimension of, of, of this business. Now, when we, so here we have some sort of from the commercial context of cooling as a service, as, a, as an idea that really flies in theory to the high level paper, sort of like what it could be. Now comes the real work. How do I operationalize an operating model? Someone producing the right product, someone producing the right tech, someone putting the right price, pricing in place, someone putting the right distribution in place, someone putting the right marketing in place, someone putting the right sales in place. And ultimately now you get into the business context for this commercial cooling as a service innovative idea that looks fucking awesome on paper to become reality to in the end be something we can capitalize on. Well, this is the business model context and it's you know, it's Pandora's box because you can go wrong in one of those things and it fucks up the whole thing. You know, your pricing is wrong, your marketing is wrong, your sales is wrong, your product is wrong, your order to cash is wrong, you know. And then here in all of this, someone has asked you, oh, I want a decision model for pricing mm -hmm. without considering how all these things are interlinked in the business context. So here I think it's, if, if you're a data scientist and you know that world, really well, what happens when you put it into the real world, you have the enterprise operating model world, you know, how will this actually be worked? And then ultimately you have, you need to go all the way to the customer, you know, how will he buy this? How will we use this? And, and this becomes, if I take Spotify as a very, as a very clear product, as an app, as a subscription, it's quite, um, I can grasp it. If you go into selling a manufacturing plant. Yeah. It's so many loose ends, sort of thing, so many different things. So I think in the B2B context of the operating model, the business model and, and the commercial context is super complex. And if you are not really careful what you're doing here, you are simply, you're, this is scary shit to build decision models if you don't understand how they will end up in the bigger picture. So it's very much a B2B, this explodes in complexity. I don't know if that helped. Yeah, I mean, for, for me, it sounds like the business context is more about designing the solution rather than uh, or uh, it, compared it's to also about model. handling all the internal constraints that your organization mm. have put in place. Mm. So, so you you have a, the commercial framing maybe is about seeing the opportunity mm. uh, and business 
it's more business about business model as well. Isn't yeah. the business model really in the commercial setting? Uh, may, maybe it is. It, it's probably it's probably somewhere in between there. And I think uh, again, uh, there's probably s- some uh, you can find this in different way. The whole point is you lead, n- need to start really holistically and looking at the whole picture before you try to start the solving the um, problem. You identify some um, opportunity, you try to find, you know, how would the solution potentially be built, not building it, but mm-hmm. designing some kind of potential solution for your business and uh, thinking about all the dependencies and, and how much work it would mean and how much it would cost and what you can sell it for, etc. And then finally you go more into implementing that, right? Right. But um, uh, let, let, let me, I, I think that if I understand the problem, the way that happens is like, Someone comes and wa- wants a decision model mm. and unfortunately hasn't taken in the whole business model uh, situation. What he is ca- a decision model? Yeah, let's go there soon. Let, let's, let's just park that one. I, mm. We're going to go there. Okay. But so he, he wants something that helps him make decisions for something, right? And he's doing it with his own frame of mind. Like he maybe works in one function in a company that is doing something and it will help him, but he hasn't really maybe taken in all the different other functions and aspects of, you know, so it's very easy. You sub optimize something by, by only looking at this without looking at the, uh, the whole thing. So typically if you fly in too fast on one small area of the problem, uh, it maybe it can work sometimes, but it's also a risk here that you're, you're not uh, solving or you're not doing the right thing. Um, uh, that's what I see a little bit with this. Yeah. And I- I- if you don't know how the, who the right business stakeholders are, for example, if you address the wrong stakeholders, you, you address the wrong problems uh, and you end up building a, a solution that's uh, not fit for purpose, or at least you, you will have a much harder job uh, getting to continuous value because it won't be implemented because of, of internal structures or external uh, factors. Um, mm. yeah. But, I, but I think a follow on question that on this, let's go there straight away. So we are now talking about decision science. Yes. And we are talking about and, and throwing out the word decision Mod- modeling. And maybe we need to put some definition and view what is that? How can we talk about a data model versus an analytical model versus a decision model? You know, can we sort of unpack this a little bit? So so basically a decision, there there is a concept called decision quality that I use as a concept and it includes different dimension of decision making that needs to be in place in order to make a good decision because the, the decision will only be as good as its weakest link. Right. Uh, and part of this decision making is to understand what information is needed, what is the uh, or what is all the information we need in order to make a decision. This is where data science normally comes in. We build a forecast, we build a, a pricing model or something like that, uh, that gives you a information, uh, about, uh, something, but you all also, you, of course you need to understand the context, but you also need to understand which are the action that follows on your decision. And what is the cost of those de- different decisions? So what's the cost of, of your several different choices or just two choices? Then what is the benefit of the outcome and what's the probability of reaching that outcome? Um, and unless you understand this whole thing, you can't optimize the decision. Uh, but in, in many cases, uh, we only provide a part of the information needed for a decision making. And then it's not a decision model, then it's just a, a forecast or a prediction, some kind. But unless you can turn that prediction into a suggested decision, it's um, it's not the decision model. So, so you need to go from predictive to prescriptive and you can only go to prescriptive if you understand uh, the utility function of the different options. 
and the costs. Um, Could you also try to exemplify that a bit, perhaps? Um, it's sometimes I feel like we were overcomplicating things. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and, and and just trying to understand some simple thing, something that we want to make a decision about, um, and just try to concretely speak about that. Can you think about about such such an example? Uh, say uh, automatic driving. Yes. Uh, uh, autonomous driving. Uh, autonomous driving. Exactly. Uh, then, what what is the relevant information that you need to understand in order to make a decision? You need to understand what's in front of you, what's road, what's not road, uh, what's the different lanes, yeah. and where are you going. So on. So so then you need to build systems to to tell you that you need to to understand from uh, computer vision maybe where's where's the road how far in front of you is the car uh, do we need a leader or not mm -hmm. um, and then we have the the model of the map that we map again so we know where we're going where we want to go um, and then there is. Uh, a consequence of, of taking one road or another in terms of time, maybe, or in terms of minimizing. You can minimize in time or you can minimize uh, energy consumption. Utility function. In Utility this. function, exactly. And then, of course, you don't want to drive off the road, right? Uh, because that ha has a very bad utility function. <laughs> uh, and Or you have a car in front of you that you don't, don't want to drive into. But maybe if they break suddenly, what, what you need to make a quick decision about: Do I mm. break or do I try to post? Mm. Um, I think this that's a great are, example. Uh, how can we map these kind of concepts that you spoke about into to this example? Then, yeah. So, so the context is pretty clear here. We yeah. described. We we have our uh, options of uh, braking, gassing, turning left yeah, or right, right, or, or it's basically it's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then um, you just, uh, if, if you know your options, you know the cost of it, the options, uh, may, maybe the costs aren't that different in terms of uh, cost. Cost of braking is maybe uh, what we could say, you lose energy if you break. Um, but the... the Knowing all this, you have a model of, of uh, the world outside, and then you can can optimize your choices. Mm. So what is a decision model uh, in this case? What is a data model in this case? What are the, the concepts that we spoke about before in this speci specific example? I, I would say a, a, a forecast is maybe the, how far in front of you is the car. Mm. That's one part of the... For, is, it, is that a prediction basically saying? There, yeah, that? That's a prediction. I yeah. would say that's the, a, a prediction uh, that goes into your decision making, mm -hmm. but that's probably what the data scientist would be asked to build. Mm -hmm. But we, we want to take it one step further. So we have, uh, have uh, all these different models. Um, uh, baked into one and we have the logic of which decision to take then. Then, then we get to the decision making. But maybe you can have a, another example that helps understand data model, analytical yeah. models, decision model. So, say I want to build an app where I'm in, re in real time making more, you know, house mortgage loans decisions. So we have now uh, a data model of, you know, who are you as a uh, buyer of the house in relation to, you know, what is your credit rating? You know, what is your income? You have a lot of data points you're collecting. And then maybe you even have uh, uh, some analytical models here. What, what, what is your uh, forecasted uh, ability to, uh, to pay back loans at, dif at, at, at different rates or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then we end up in, in a situation where with someone, you need to make a decision on how much money am I willing to loan this person in relation to this property, in relation to this location. So, you know, like, uh, um, um, so basically it's a little bit like you have a data model, you have data points in many different things that build sort of the, the data that you need in order to do something. Then I would argue you have several analytical models that does pieces of the puzzle 
And then basically... What's the difference between an analytical model and the data model? For, for me, uh, if, uh, the way I would describe it is that you have uh, you have the data model as the, as, the, as the core sort of you know definition and ontology or whatever you want to call it of the actual you know what is the what is the uh, how does the you different mean like data, a data point, structure like yes. how the data how it's structured uh, yeah for me really it, not something that makes a prediction and no 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 so a data okay. model the, the, the way okay. we use the word data model. Uh, at uh, Scania is like uh, model the different data, how they are related to each other. Mm-hmm. You know, okay, n- so no analytics. N- I would call it the data structure. But okay, yeah, okay whatever. So data structure. Uh, data ontology or whatnot. You, have, so. you need a data structure. And then you have several. Uh, m- m- maybe you also have metadata on top of that. Yeah, so yeah. that yeah. makes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so you kind of build a representation of you, your you, world. So, so this is, uh, uh, in a way, building a representation, you know, the facts sort yeah. of thing and how they relate. Then you have a lot of maybe several different things that you are analyzing or predicting, like like your what is your propensity to be able to pay back and all that. Mm. That goes in as a, as a key component. The result of your analytical models, one or several, goes into the fundamental uh, decision model. So I'm like, and typically, if if I go to a bank, they have business rule decision models where basically mm-hmm. say you need to have, uh, you know, you need to earn this amount of money, you need to have this income in order to be able to, and then if you have five children, then you're you're supposed we 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 have analyzed that your 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 forecasted cost that you can bear is this. Therefore, you know, all these considered, the decision model then puts the frame on it. Can I just challenge the whole discussion here a bit and say, isn't all of this just making predictions? Yes. In in a sense, it is making predictions, but it's adding the logic of what you're trying to optimize on top of it. But a prediction can be based based from, from data that you have put in some kind of model that makes a prediction. It could also be based on rules that you have. It doesn't necessarily be data. It can be heuristic that's placed in a set of business rules, for example. But in some way, you have a way, way to make prediction. And, and that's the, the prediction model, if you call it that. Mm-hmm. And, and that isn't that the, the only two things that we really have? We have some kind of thing that makes prediction, some model. Then you have different inputs to that being heuristic rules or data. I think that's simpl- too simplistic, Anders. I mean, like if I if I take the example now that we can use data and, and people understanding and, and, and modeling and structuring the data, mm-hmm. and then we have someone who can basically start doing data science, they're doing different predictions, and we are moving on some sort of um, trajectory here, all the way over to extreme domain expertise on something where you basically, based on your experiences or based on the world, we need to decide on things. So when you come to a topic where you have complex decisions to be made, you know, we are talking now about going from meaningless uh, decisions, automated, you know, simple, uh, you know, uh, RPAs to to more cognitive, more complex situations. Even humans would be part of a model that makes a decision potentially. Of, of course, yeah. Or yeah. Data or mm-hmm. Exactly. Or so what, what I, I think I think there is a there is a clear distinction here in what I would then refer to as a data model. And, and data structure, yeah, yeah. modeling yes. the data structure mm-hmm. versus modeling the different parts of the analytics to actually... Analy- what's analytics in this case? For me, analytics means something else. That's what I think I'm reacting to a bit. For me, the, the, for me there is like the predictions in relation to single, you know, like, like single uh, topics. Like if I take the mortgage example, I, we, we, we are talking about the, the algorithm that predicts what is your propensity to be able to, to take on cost or whatever. Mm-hmm. Okay. This is just one component in the end when you are trying to make a, the aggregated final decision. Should I give this guy a loan? And basically I will give him a loan, but more importantly, to what interest rate? You know, sure. So it's of course it's all predictions if you say it like that. But yeah. I think you're working on on different abstract abstraction levels here. Yeah, but that's what you know Kahneman is speaking about all the time. You have different levels of abstraction, even a continuous scale. I would argue. So I think that even he says that there's not really a two levels of of, of abstractions here. Uh, there is a continuous scale of different levels of abstraction that you make predictions on. But, but in, I, in essence, it's still. But a way but, to make predictions based on different things like data, rules, humans, or whatnot. But but I, but I think this is very useful to understand that you know predictions in relation to uh, predicting, to prescribing things, to recommending things. And I mean, like the, I mean, like if if you if you look into uh, you know w- what is the most uh, cited uh, 
decisioning model framework out there is the ODA model. Have you heard about that? No. So ODA stands for, it comes, it comes from decision modeling that was from aerial combat dogfighting. So how can we help uh, jet fighter pilots in aerial combat make faster decisions, the correct decisions. And ultimately, why did we need that? In order, you know, everything goes faster and faster and faster. So we need to build these decisions into even how the plane works and all that. So UDA stands for uh, observe, orient, uh, decide, act, loop. Observe what happened with that when we make this decision. Uh, uh, so, oh, sorry, observe, orient, I think, act, deci uh, decide, act, UDA. Mm -hmm. to, so basically here we have sort of a framework for how sort of we can make decisions. So I think, I think there is a different, I mean, like to say prediction, yes, you're right. Everything is predictions, mm -hmm. but we are sort of moving into a more and more cognitive and higher level of intelligence in relation to, you know, what, how we are compounding and making fundamental decisions happen. And I think it warrants uh, its own, um, I really think it warrants its own. Um, I mean, you could be uh, right. I think and it's a good example. I, I, I think another example could be weather forecasts. Uh, that's a prediction. It tells you the temperature will be 20 degrees tomorrow. It will rain. And uh, towards the evening, it will be sunny or something like that. Uh, but what the decision model would do or a prescriptive model would do is say, oh, today is the, uh, tomorrow you uh, ought to sow or you don't, or you shouldn't sow tomorrow maybe if you're a farmer because uh, it takes a lot of different inputs into account and turns that into a suggestion. I like that example. Yeah, uh, it's just, you know, I'm trying to challenge and be a bit uh, controversial here perhaps, but but uh, well, I, w I really like, you know, having really easy to understand definitions of things. And, and I think one of the broadest definition of predictions as I've seen mm -hmm. is basically um, making information you don't have from, from information you do have. And I think it's a really nice definition. But if you use that definition of prediction, basically everything is predictions in some sense, right? Yeah. Uh, but adding on that, then uh, a decision model would be uh, suggest suggesting an action based on... A, uh, uh, <laughs> I lost it. Because, I mean, building on, on the prediction definition mm. can then... Or, and based on that, suggest an action. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so, so uh, predictions doesn't have to be actions, but it could be, I guess. And, and you could add things from a prediction. I mean, a prediction could be like, it doesn't have to be about the future. It could be simply what's in this picture. Mm -hmm. So information you do have is the picture. It's pixel values, basically. What you don't have is what's in the picture. So the picture can say, is it the dog or not? Mm. Or hot dog or not hot, hot or, dog kind of thing. And and that's new information, but it isn't, doesn't really necessarily say anything about what action to take. To take, yes. But, but you could so have what, what predictions about actions as well. Yeah. It's just predictions is more general. Yeah. But it can be about actions, but it can be about just creating some piece of information that you don't have. But, but that, that's a good example. I like that. If, if you have a model for a... Uh, a computer vision model, yeah. uh, you know, and the error rate, or you know, the precision and recall. But you, you can assign different costs to the different uh, failure modes and and being correct or not. Mm. And if you then know, figure out what is the consequences of the different failures, you can optimize the model to minimize the cost of failures. Uh, and then you have some kind of decision model because it takes the outcomes, the cost of different outcomes into account. Yeah, I think it's well uh, motivated here and uh, sorry for being a bit controversial. No, no, it's here. good. It's, it's, uh, no, it's uh, really it's good. Very helpful. I think, I think it's, you know, in my view then, you know, the decision making is a type of prediction system that makes some clear actions, a decision to make compared to other predictions, which is simply perhaps adding some piece of information that yeah. doesn't really help you in the decision-making process. And I think that could be a useful definition for what the decision model is. Yeah. I like the way you sorted this out for us now, Anders, Thank you. because in, in one way, it's all about predictions, yeah. but we have different 
we are in different stages mm-hmm. and therefore we we get what are the predictions of the best decision to make and then you can roll back what are the pre- predictions of these different uh, input valuables that yeah. they are relevant or where is the core ahead of us yes yeah not? so they are pre- it's all about predictions but but in the end <coughs> if if you relate it back to the driving car analogy mm-hmm. We, we get to the point where we have uh, algorithms, you know, uh, to help, you know, how we do the whole thing, like in, in, into the vector space. You know, first we need to observe. Uh, OODA yeah. is very much fits with the vector space, right? Like first we need to observe, get the data in, then we need to orient ourselves. We need to build this up in the vector space. Mm. Then from here, we, we come to the sort of the cognitive part. We need to then take action this is the decision making modeling and ultimately based on that, that action something happens right so i think it's like someone asked what what's the hard part of, of you know to elon musk is it to build the ooda part or the decisioning part or the decisioning part is fairly straightforward if you have the ori- observe yeah. and orient and if you use traditional at least in my view uh, terminology for AI, I would say that you have the perception part, which is ga- going from data to some kind of world model or understanding of the context. From that context, you want to reason a bit about what action to take. Mm-hmm. Then you take an action and you interact with the environment and then you get some feedback. And then if you go into reinforcement learning terms, that basically means you have an environment that you act in. Once you act in it, you get some kind of reward that is being fed back to the model mm-hmm. and it continues being updated. So I think, you know, these are basically saying all the same thing. Yes. But it's just different terms. But, but I think this explaining. is super, what you, you gave me a really aha moment here. Yeah. Hypothesis. I have said to become data and AI ready, one of the biggest hurdles we have is that we have such a language barrier yeah. between the different disciplines. Exactly. I think it's more so, terminology. So based. here, the, the AI scientist community has already sorted this out, but in a terminology that doesn't make sense to anyone else than to Anders or when we sit here and he explains it. No, no, seriously. For a business person, if you, when you exemplify it, it makes total sense. Yeah. But if you use, load up the words with no example, what were they? Just percep- uh, yeah, you, you have perception and oh, reasoning. Perception, reasoning. And that's the tor- two main part, I would say. But then if you add like reinforcement learning terminology, which is different. Um, then you observe the world uh, and the world being an environment is usually the term that you use. Yeah, and From that term, you have some kind of model that makes a prediction, which is some kind of action to take. You interact with the environment and you get a reward, which is usually the terminology that you get, which is basically yeah. utility in, in your and, terms. And, and I would then argue complete mambo jumbo Mm-hmm. For a business person, yeah, probably. complete mumbo jumbo, perfect sense yeah. when you say it. Sorry, uh, no, I, I but I, I think it's it's not mumbo jumbo to me, but because it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, but it makes sense to me. Uh, but but uh, I would say the reasoning and the suggested action. This is where we say decision mm. model. Yeah. Because if you only have the perception, yeah, that's where you do only do prediction, and that's. Uh-oh. Prediction could be the reasoning part as well. I would argue, but, 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 still, I, but yeah. I think I think this is quite profound. Like that, it's this is one of the core problems. We are very good good in I our think disciplines. We solved something here in this discussion and trying to connect two different worlds of terminology. Trying to, but I get goosebumps because this is what, what what I, I have found as like one of my missions. Sort of mm-hmm. like we have a cross disciplinary team now, mm-hmm. and in order to solve mm-hmm. this, we need to find a common lingo we understand yes. each other in. Yeah. And it can only be done by sitting here arguing and then realize oh, we are talking about the same thing yes, but we use exactly. different words. Yeah. True. Like so often it's down to uh, ontology or... Uh, yeah. I mean, it's yeah, a so semantic gap. Semantic gap. Yeah. It's a semantic gap. Yeah. But what, what is also, you can never solve this if you don't put the different disciplines in the same room mm-hmm. but nutting it out. You can never ever solve this if you don't have the same resources in the same team and building the lingo within the team so they understand what they're talking about. And then it would be helpful if we as an industry started to sort of go a little bit more humble into the different disciplines and trying to, okay, I use these words, what do you use? Can we come up with a common word that we all can agree upon? That would help quite a bit. Yeah, definitely. But in order to get there, you need to spend time together. Yes. Mm. And that, that's a major uh, scarce resource. Time from, from your daily work to spend on, on a, in my team or for, t- 
time from the business people to spend in my team or the but, vice versa. But this is a good segue into a more general topics where I want to start with the first topic now. Based on this whole experience and what happened in the, right now, mm-hmm. what can we say about useful ways of organizing data science, AI and business? You know, are they sort of patterns and anti-patterns that on a general level, and I'm not saying it's easy to politically get it done in a large organization, but just by following the fundamentals of what we said now, can we draw out some organizational ideas around this that we have learned or that we believe in? It would be fun to hear about how, how you organize teams and mix of competences at Tetra Pak and, and really try to have an as efficient and, and uh, productive team as possible. Um, difficult topic. We, we, I think I'd rather argue from a more general okay, sure. point of view, but I, I think it's so important to have business or let's say the, the, the expert on the topic you're trying to, to work on in the team and spending a lot of time in the team and, and so this is a domain expert. Domain expert. So, someone Not the data who, scientist, so to speak. Exactly. So, someone who really understands the domain and what we're trying to optimize and how, how the domain works and uh, the politics internally or w- what's possible or not. And also someone who to take ownership of this once it's built, one, when we have an MVP, to bring it to the rest of the world. To value capture. Exactly. To value capture. And and that's not easy. Uh, e- even though if you get really, really good people in this role, and I have experienced that, uh, we we all have a common goal of of uh, building a solution for for the business, and uh, but even in those cases, it takes so much energy to drive organizational change. So, so we, we haven't cracked that and uh, I'm not sure. No, but I think, I, think, have. I think we're all struggling here because there, there, we are sort of, we're battling between sort of the discipline expertise and the, and the home of the discipline. So we, we, we need to have critical mass around, okay, if you've never done data science or data engineering before, it's kind of be pretty stupid to have everybody spread out. So there's a logic here that how do we build critical mass around the discipline? But then we get to the core topic of embedding algorithms in the business business to capture value for real. And then we need to recognize that, especially in the B2B context or in the sort of in the enterprise context, when you do an algorithm and you place that in a user, you are changing their normal workflow. If they are going to have value out of this model or whatever it is, it needs to fit into what work you're doing. So, so whether you like it or not, it, you are re-engineering their daily work. Exactly. Uh, and the, then the problem is, are, am I working against their incentives and f- oh, or for exactly. the, their incentives? Because their incentive setup is really important in terms of, of my ability to, to build something that works better for the company. But so, so we have, we have the court now seen challenge of getting critical mass around the competence area like this, that this may be new that data science coming into an organization that hasn't done it before versus the fundamental truth of being close to the business problem mm-hmm. and to the business value capture and that, and to crack that nut on that balance. So one thing is, of course, uh, as you said before, to just make iterative or incremental improvements to whatever solution you have. And another is to find these kind of innovative new solutions that potentially the mainstream customers or users are not really interested in, mm-hmm. but could be the big, big next thing. Yeah, and I think that also uh, relates to having new business models, mm-hmm. uh, which is not easy. Right. So, so you, if you try to go to like package as a service, we don't have it right yet. Mm-hmm. Maybe we will we'll one day, but it, it's about taking ownership of the customer's risk. So I will take 
all your risk, but you will pay me for every package I deliver. Uh, so, but but in, in, um, I recently heard like Amazon's way of doing innovation, uh, and, and I think I don't agree all, all the time about you know what Amazon is doing and their way of, of solution things. But but they have some good ideas, and, and they're apparently very successful companies in some measures, uh, like money. <laughs> 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 um, but do do you have a way to just make like capture all the innovative ideas of of the coworkers or the people that you have in? Your organization. I wouldn't say systematically. I have a list of good ideas. I have a list. I, as I work a lot with sales, I, I organize uh, my own projects like uh, sales projects. So I have leads, I have opportunities, and then I make the sell and do like a project. That. I like that. So, so I have a list of uh, I think thirty four uh, leads for next year mm. or potential. potential. Inno innovations, improvements. Yeah, improvements, pr uh, innovations. Or so some of them are b really big, won't happen next year. But I need to work on them and keep them alive. Mm -hmm. And some of them are uh, uh, very concrete, very operational, and uh, will probably an easy sell. Mm -hmm. But since it's then incremental change on what we have today, it will also be incremental the value. Yeah. But, but if we go a bit more philosophical now, uh, time is flying as we away as well, but um, we can think about at least if there are two extreme differences in, in driving value for the world now, not yeah. value for Tetra Pak, well, value for the world, <laughs> or trying to get closer to some kind of sustainable energy solution that we have in the world, for example, we can think about Tesla is doing it in one way. Uh, and, and DeepMind uh, that have the goal to create AGI, artificial general intelligence, is doing it in a different way, I would argue. So if we take like the deep, DeepMind way, they are basically doing more basic research type of work. They're trying out different solutions into building something that becomes intelligent. It's not really that it provides value. I mean, they have some, they started to go in that direction now with alpha fold and protein folding, and that can have some real you know, positive value short term. But the main way I would argue that they are uh, conducting their work is to have more basic research, trying to build up this kind of general intelligence solution somehow that long term ahead, 20 years ahead, will have some kind of big potential benefit. That's one way to do it. If we take the Tesla approach, I would argue that they take the opposite approach, that they have some kind of thing that they want to put on the market directly. They have a car that and, and that they simply want people to buy now. And, and then they use it and they just from that car trying to get more money to continuously improve that car. So long term ahead, it becomes so beneficial to use. People will just switch from gasoline cars into electric cars. Uh, simply because the functionality of it is so much better, like autonomous driving part, or it could be simply because it's cheaper, because they have so efficient manufacturing of it and, and whatnot. And, and I would argue that they are doing it from an engineering point of view and, and also from a business point of view, because it, it really needs to make sense from a business point of view, whereas DeepMind is going the opposite way. So one is more like you know, basic research, research approach, the other is more business engineering approach. Do you see approximately what I mean? What yeah, do you yeah think definitely. Uh, do you think uh, one is better than the other, or is it? I think we need both. I need to. Yes. <laughs> we need to be ambidextrous, yeah. even in this space. Uh, I think to s once you really understand a problem, you can go to first principle thinking and find solutions to it. Then you make experiments. That's mm -hmm. something that did, we didn't talk about. We, we tried to do experiments in the business yeah. and to, to test our hypothesis. Uh, but, but that only works if you have a hypothesis, right? Mm -hmm. Or you, you have done your first principle thinking and have an idea about the solution you want to implement. Uh, and uh, for the climate crisis, it, this could be gen geoengineering, like putting a lot of uh, certain chemicals in, in the atmosphere to cool down the earth for as a short term s solution or a stopgap measure. And I think that's, that's uh, probably a work, something we need to do. 
just in order to buy us time to do all the transformate other changes we need to do. Mm. Uh, but then we also need to do this uh, more exploratory uh, research w without a, a clear goal uh, because we learn through that process mm. and without basic research, we, we, we wouldn't be where we are today. And I think mm. curiosity is probably the main driving force of, of, of humans. Uh, but, I, but I like a little bit, uh, this is a huge macro topic, but I, I think you can bring it back down to earth by using the analogy, we need to be left-handed, right-handed. So let's iterate what we talked about here, that we need to both be good at, within the business or within any context, the incremental improvement idea. Yeah. But it's not enough. You need to have the other, the right-hand side working on the leapfrogging, mm. which is the real innovate, innovation, uh, which is different, right? And how, and I, I've come to a similar conclusion, as a company, you need, you, need, you, need, you need to build an operating model, an organizational model that is ambidextrous or has both engines running. Mm. If you, and, and typically it's happening, like you have, a, you have a startup, it's all innovation, 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 and you get to a certain scale, or you, you've been around for a hundred years, you've gone from uh, in, into the life, the S curve is in, you know, you go to growth, all this maturity, and here we start only incrementing on this because the risk is too high. And here we have the downfall, right? Here we have the Kodak, here we have the foss fossil happening, yeah. right? So how to, in a large corporation especially, be both innovative, the real innovation, mm -hmm. and then at the same time be micro innovative or uh, improvement oriented. I, th I think it's really the only way. Yeah. And uh, I think I, that's what you're asking if it's one is better or the other. I think you need both. Yeah. I, I, I agree. And to be uh, put a little bit of a dark side of it, uh, I can't remember who said it, but it's really good. It's ch change isn't uh, mandatory because survival isn't necessary. <laughs> that's oh, a good that's phrase. That's another t-shirt there as well. Change isn't mandatory because survival isn't, isn't necessary. necessary. Oh, that's, a talk, that's a good one. Yeah, I have, I have, I want to, I want to end on one topic. Um, one of the reasons we started this AI after work is, is, is a way to sort of demystify AI or to talk about AI, but in, in another sense, building a, a strong community, you know, like getting to know the different profiles, people doing data and AI in different facets, right? Mm. From the leaders to the uh, super experts. So and, and someone has said it uh, many times, I think, um, you know, uh, Gil Blad from AI Sweden said, why do we need, uh, why do we need uh, uh, AI Sweden? We, we talked about this, oh, because no one can do this alone, right? So how important do you think the whole idea of community participating in conferences peer to peer is for, for us to sort of move this forward uh, efficiently? And, I, and I'm used to put the last, framing on this, you've been a, a very uh, valuable contributor in the Airplane Alliance, which is a peer to peer community around data and AI best practices, uh, where we are sharing open source ideas, co creating on how do we do this? What lingo do we use? What practices do we use? So, so, you know, what's your thinking around this community on, on this the data and AI community, so to speak? Just speaking for myself, it's absolutely necessary. And I mean, we, living in the south of Sweden, um, we the data science community isn't that big, and um, the opportunities for having having uh, these creative sessions are also limited in, in a in a sense. And, and we we are um, also in our daily work limited by our project focus. So uh, unless we have these other forums for testing new ideas or uh, bouncing ideas against each other, their change will be so slow. I, I myself, I think best when I talk 
uh, and verbalize and have it communicate with others. Uh, and if I sit by myself and try to think, it becomes an echo chamber and yeah. it's really, really hard to conquer. I'm not challenged or, and I'm not concrete criticizing my ideas. Um, the, o- the only other way I found is to write down my ideas I- in some kind of notes, uh, building a second brain. Yeah. That's the only alternative to having these for- forums uh, and still developing. Uh, and I, 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 I wouldn't be where I am today without uh, the input from others. I mean, we still stand on the shoulder of giants in a sense or standing on the shoulders of each other uh, each other yeah it's a I bit, think of boots, quote. Yeah, bit of uh, bootstrapping yeah but uh, and uh, and uh, for me th- th- that whole conversation has also been a little about sometimes this is a little bit depends on where you work but if you work in a, a company with a with a proud analog history so to speak and th- there are quite few in your discipline yeah so then both for therapy and also sort of for, for energizing, uh, I think to meet your peers and discuss how did you solve this or what, you know, what blockers are we talking? I mean, like this is the, the real discussions. Maybe you don't really do them on stage in a conference, but you, you can do them in short and smaller settings. For me, it's also about getting the energy yeah. to make this work when maybe you feel misunderstood a lot of times at, at home because yeah. they simply don't have the lingo or the same understanding. So just, think, just seeing that other had the same problem as you are, yeah. have or have ideas for how to solve them or attack them yeah. and you get energized and get new ideas for how to. Yeah. So yeah. if you have a large community of step one is to have a good community within the or company organization, of course, yeah. but we don't all have that. So. We're lucky in that way. We, we're a fairly large group. We're about 20 people, but still yeah. it becomes a, uh, you, you get on the bandwagon effect yeah. here yeah. as well. Uh, we, we are kind of have the same conversations over and over internally uh, because of our context and s- stuff like that, but we are pretty aligned, but it's great to have this conversation with people from the outside that are not stuck in our situation, getting new ideas and new inputs. That's really important. What's your view here, Anders? I mean, like if, if I back up the tape a little bit, I mean, like you, you have, there was, there's a quite large following of the meetups that you, was created back in the Spotify days. Mm-hmm. And I think that meetup group, if you, if you collected that, it would be still be a quite big number. Yeah. So what was that story all about? Why did you do that? <laughs> ah, to recruit. Yes, <laughs> simple, <laughs> that simple is the, the simple answer. Um, I mean, I, I, of course, it's important for any company to have a community for recruitment purposes. Um, but it also is a very, very valuable way to, to just learn. And I, I think if we compare it actually to doing a podcast like this, mm. doing meetups is also or any kind of discussion or, or presentation, but that is more in a discussion format. That is more like exactly. meetup where you actually speak and have time to have proper discussions is a way of learning that I think is, is super hard to achieve otherwise. So any type of activity where people are incentivized to have discussions is something that is very surprisingly efficient in developing the mind or learning, you know, what works and does not work. So I think a lot of companies should really try to find at least some channels Mm. where they simply do not have a one way presentation saying, this is my awesome new product, or this is the great new numbers from Apple saying how much we've sold and abusing statistics. Sorry for being bashing <laughs> Apple here, but that's your favorite bashing uh, um, object. <laughs> but actually, having true discussions that uh, that actually have also a really valuable feedback to you as a company that that is, I, th- I think, a, that was a surprising like side effect, more or less, of, yeah. of the meetups at the Spotify times. But and and with Airplane Alliance, we, we we've had a very high ambition where we have discussed how we can do co-creation. It's, it's not so easy, but what we have found 
And I still think this is very true. Like if you find a common topic, uh, like we had an example, we need to better understand the commercial side of, 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 of the of the data products or and defining a business role like the business solution owner or the product owner, you know, how does that work? So when you put the problem on the table and maybe there's one then, uh, one peer that has a very concrete problem at home and then we are working on that together and trying to actually co-create uh, intellectual property together, I find that an extreme accelerated learning curve beyond discussion. So discussion is great, but if when you then try to actually build something or work out something together and, or put the text together, mm. that really forces you to think and to, you know, learn and master the topic. And actually, I think that fosters, if without you thinking about it, you're picking up even deeper of the other side of the table and you understand more, more facets of the problem because someone else is describing the problem in their context and then you're contrasting it to your contracts and all of a sudden you've gone 360 around the problem from many angles that you could never have met. But but the core topic is co-creation on a, like we have found a topic that we want to work on instead of just having sort of just... So I think there are different levels here how community can help and actually trying to crack the nut on how to make that really useful. I, I think it's super important to accelerate what we're doing. And simply as Daniel Gilblad said, you know, we are, we can't do everything ourselves. And, and that is so true. And um, the only, you know, the more we can collaborate inside a company and outside the company, the faster we will uh, build value. Yeah, I think it's that um, simple. Um, it, yeah, exactly. I feel that's a pretty good uh, sort of rounding off of, of this session today. But uh, a couple of uh, classical questions. Uh, what's next? W what are you up to? I am I'm a father of three young children. So <laughs> <laughs> my planning horizon is like one week. <laughs> um, any, any fun projects you are, you know, what's on your sales, uh, in your sales funnel? What do you want to tackle next? Oh, um, I would love to uh, get into the package designs Ooh. Uh, and AI and, okay. uh, and uh, AB testing. You know, with testing. all the generative AI coming yeah. out these days, exactly. you know, imagine if Tetra Pak would do that. And yeah. oh, I think you have an amazing opportunity there. Do, do you know any other company who has their product in everybody's home? No, exactly. Right. So, yeah. but so you said it, or someone else said it, uh, it isn't uh, even uh, Tetra Pak is like one of the last printers in the world. Yeah, one of the largest print or the largest printer in the world. I, I'm not, at least in, in terms of, of the amount of ink we buy or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, crazy. You could use it for so much good, I think. Yeah, I, I, I really think so. But it's, it's again a, a question of. Uh, building business, innovating on business models and building a product around it. Uh, and it's, um, I, I need to find the right partners well, within the company. Can I just challenge one comment there? I mean, what's mo most important? Is it the customer value or the business value for Tetra Pak that should come first when it comes to packaging design? It's, it's the customer value. Um, I would say I think that so. will pay off business wise as well, yeah. more long term. Mm. But I think it's really dangerous if you optimize for business value short term. Yeah, yeah definitely. Right? I mean, uh, unless we we solve a customer problem, mm. right? They, there is no value, a sustainable value business to, model there, yeah, right? <laughs> so, so that that must always come first to, to understand what problem am I solving for the consumer or the customer. I think that's one of the things that Amazon exactly doing a lot. I mean, they, they claiming that they are customer centric first, you know, mm. that that's the only thing that they use to guide their decisions. I hope it's true as well, but, but still it sounds really good and, yeah. and I wish it was true and it probably is. Yeah. Last question. Do you have any good ideas of names that you think we should have on yeah. this pod? I mean, you, you have been around for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and most of my contacts are in uh, Skåne, but uh, there is uh, my good, very good friend Matthias Jönsson, who's now uh, in uh, at Mask, mm. um, 
who uh, would be brilliant to have on here. And Mask was winners in the Dare Awards last year, so they've been doing some good stuff. Two awards they won at Mask. Yeah, so uh, he, he's in the pricing department. Interesting. Uh, he's doing a. Uh, Matthias Jönsson. Jönsson. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and I have a lot of colleagues, of course, within the theater pack, but uh, probably be boring to hear the same story again. <laughs> um, so, and of course, uh, in we, we in theater pack all look to Casey at Google. Yeah. So uh, if you can get her. Yeah. Casey. Casey, yeah. Yes, of course. Yes. Right. Okay. <laughs> that no would be brilliant. Google can sponsor that. <laughs> <laughs> Rasmus, awesome. Thank you for having you, uh, Thank you. Uh, on on camera, and now looking forward to have more discussions and. Yeah, we have uh, yeah, we, we have we, more friends in AI after work today. Uh, so we, we need to have the discussion about consciousness. I was oh, missing oh, that one. I should have said that before. No, you oh, okay. All right. oh. But just yeah. t- do it. Tell me it. Okay. Okay. Very quickly. Okay. Good. What's your, what do you think about consciousness? Oh, that's quickly. Oh. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I think emergent consciousness is possible in in uh, AI or machines, but. I think we're far from there yet, but I definitely believe that uh, consciousness is much more common among animals than we think. And the, of course, it comes down to, to what how we define consciousness. Yeah. Do you have a preferred definition or some kind of descriptive way of yeah, describing it? I I don't. I should have, have uh, read up mm. before. <laughs> Saying that just now, but uh, you cannot put up like a topic like that. <laughs> so, so let me give a stab at yeah. that and see what you agree and disagree with. So we, we have spoken about this topic a number of times, but but one way to to frame it, I think people actually over romanticize the topic, yeah. including Lex Friedman and et other and, and a lot of other people. I think it it's much more simplistic than I, at least I like a more simplistic definition of it. So in some way. Uh, I would argue it's about being able to perceive the world, the environment, mm. and and then take action in it. Um, and that can be a Tesla car. It can even be a potentially a um, chess playing uh, machine. The only thing the environment is about is the board and the, uh, the 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 pieces that you have on the board. But it can perceive what the mm. positions of the pieces are. It can reason about what action to take. And it can interact with that environment. In that way, it's conscious, not about all of our world, only about a very, very, very tiny, small part. And in that way, it's conscious about that. Would you agree with that? I, you have said this before, I know. so I couldn't yeah. sleep one night. Yeah. So I have a question for you. Okay. Right. There is so many, uh, let's say, uh, um, you have insects, you have animals, uh, mm-hmm. you have humans. Or, or, so if you have to put where AI is right now, so mm. let's say it's bacteria, yeah. it's a worm, uh, it's a, I don't know. Probably somewhere It's right a there. dog, it's a duck. And a, because if, well, how you're explaining it is because it's, it's conscious in its own uh, right box, yeah. right? So where it is? Uh, a worm is probably a good description, I would say, but it's, you know, we have to quote the Ray Kirchwald here, and I, and I don't think people understand the concept of ex, you know exponential development. That's why, you know, even if we are at the worm stage today with machines, having exponential development here means that he could be right. Mm-hmm. It, it could be 2029 when we actually have super intelligent machines out there, mm-hmm. and that would mean that they have a consciousness that supersedes ours. Because even, you know, it, it's not a linear development. We, we know it's not linear. So the um, question is, you know, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't, ex- yeah, even if we, we are at the worm stage, it, we still can have super intelligence in, in a couple of years or 10 years. Right. But then right. it will be a dog. No, it would or be a bird. It super would be human. superhuman. Right. So, so the, 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 the craziness with exponentiality is, of course, like, yeah. where are you? Where, where are we really on this curve? And it's flat, 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 flat. And then all of a sudden you're, you're flat right if, before the, it starts really. Yeah. 
And so it's like, you know, exp- you know, ex- understanding exponentiality is like, you know, you, you count like how many times can you fold the paper and all that or. And just seeing the explosion of the, of the scaling of AI models now in just recent years, it's like, it's truly exponential. You can easily see that if you map that out uh, in whatever chart, it is truly exponential in the size and the scale and the performance of AI models in, in recent years. But, but Maybe it's a good slide to make. Yeah. I think that they, mm-hmm. it would be very valuable to share. But, but is consciousness more important to talk about than intelligence? Or is it the same thing? Now, I, I was coming to that because I think what you described was more intelligence than consciousness. It's a, I think we can connect it to them. I, I can go into, you know, my preferred definition of intelligence as well and consciousness. I, I think they are different, but I think the same argument you can make for intelligence, being narrow intelligence, can be made for consciousness. So you can have narrow or consciousness, consciousness or yeah. general consciousness. I think you can certainly have, I wouldn't argue, or I wouldn't even say that humans have general consciousness. We have a very narrow consciousness, uh, you know, just as um, Jan LeCun says that the human brain is, is very narrow. So we have human level AI, which is different from general AI. General AI is so much more, and, and the human brain is extremely limited. I mean, you you forget things all the time. You can't do calculus. You can't do so many things. So imagine, and, and you're you know, conscious you, in your own world. Yeah, because you don't. And exist you only have anymore. two eyes yes. here and some sensors. You know, the Tesla cars have eight cameras going in three sixty degrees. It can be far more conscious about the world surrounding the car than a human ever could. It's narrow, but it's better. Mm-hmm. Just as you can have narrow skills, intelligence that supersedes humans in, in chess easily, or go, or cars, or doing, you know, understanding X-rays or whatnot. It's easy but, to supersede but, humans but we have, in a narrow but, space. But we have some sort of general consciousness in the relation to like how our neurons fire up and how we sort of mm-hmm. learn and learn, constant learning and. And so something is happening. It, it's trans- we are, our consciousness is of course transforming. How would you describe it? The consciousness of a baby before it has language. How would you describe consciousness of a four-year-old? How would you describe consciousness of me, Henrik, as an eighteen-year-old party man at university? Do you actually have a background in psychology? I know Jan LeCun also have a psychology degree, and he often speaks about babies and in the yeah. stage that they have before they understand what the mirror is. And that's something that is hidden behind furniture or something will actually appear even if it's blocked or, um, you know, not and, and the same can be done with cats and dogs. And yeah. they do this experiments with, with uh, cats and dogs. There is some discussion about the way because cats don't react to themselves in a mirror in the same way, uh, like monkeys do. But it could also be said that uh, cats are are predators in another way. So, so it, uh, uh, it's it's is an interesting topic. I and uh, in uh, the mechanical definition you had, I would say that yeah, we that if you have perception and a world model internally, uh, it does sound a bit like uh, consciousness, but I, there is also a whole field of academia yeah. uh, focus on this. And I, I'm not sure what the current definition there is, uh, but I, I totally agree with what you said about exponential growth. It's impossible for us to understand it, even though we can describe it intellectually, we still don't act. We don't put our money where our mouth is, as yes. you said. We we clearly show over and over that we don't understand it. Um, Human brain doesn't really compute exponential. We we compute linear yeah. in some ways or yeah. logarithmic, as you said. said yeah. <laughs> and we potentially are decreasing in intelligence, as some people argue. Uh, so. What do you mean? Like we don't have to have it in our brain. We use, we have, we have our second brain in our pocket. No, no, no. I, I, see, I literally mean the, the biological part of our brain is potentially decreasing shrinking, shrinking. In, in our capacity to, to be intelligent, but we are enforcing that with, of course, mobile phones, computers and whatnot that we are augmenting ourselves with. But Rasmus, why did you want to have a conversation around consciousness? Why is that important? Or why is it, why is it interesting? Oh, I, I think these topics are really interesting and to think about just as uh, when will we have a, a general uh, uh, what's it called artificial general general AI, AI, general AI. Uh, and if we will have it and I, I 
they are important topics to think about as well because of exponential growth. Yeah. Because we will not be ready if it happens. I'm not saying it, it, it will happen, but if it happens, we will not be ready because it will happen so fast that we, we uh, and I think that's a very good point that Mark Steng, Max Tengmark do in, in Life 3.0, that uh, we need to start thinking about this now because otherwise we will be way behind. Uh, and the same happens with, we, we totally knew everything we needed to know about pandemics way back in the past. We were totally unprepared. Totally unprepared. Yeah. And that's also exponential growth. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that we learn something from the pandemic? Uh, if the same thing happens tomorrow, uh, how different would we react? If it happens tomorrow, we will act differently. If it happens in 10 years, we will be back to where we were. Exactly. Because we are, we are so very, we, we can't handle risk that have a low frequency, but a high impact as humans. These are the kind of events that will kill us as a species. It's the same as an action, you know, as a decision. You make yeah. a decision. If you don't follow up on the decision. Yeah. Uh, and and basically we, we are great at doing decisions around high frequency events, mm -hmm. things that happens often and we can learn quickly. But if we don't get the external feedback, we, we, we never take the, the intellectual uh, knowledge in, into, we don't internalize it and act on it. Same thing with the uh, solar flares. There was a massive solar flare in, uh, I don't remember the year now, in, in the 1800s, uh, where telegraphs started burning and stuff like that. If that happened today, Totally unprepared. Uh, there is a, some, some, of course, some preparedness in, in the electrical grids are kind of prepared for it, but uh, only to a certain magnitude above that. All trans uh, transformers will be fried. Uh, all the big ones that's connected to the grid will be fried. And that would have a... Imagine what will happen in our society today versus in the 1800s. Exactly. So, so let's say all, all, all the uh, transistors, uh, some of the big transistors are fried. Lead time for one is two, three years. Do, they, do you think they have the production capacity to do more one or two of these? No, we would be, half the world would be without electricity for very long time and in reality we know this and we also know that the event of a solar flare and although happened very seldom uh, probably you know it yeah. will happen again yeah it will happen at some point sometime but we, we since we it doesn't happen all the time it we, has sort of fallen back in our consciousness so so we, we can model the strengths we can model the frequency but uh, since it's not very likely to happen next year we don't act upon it. It's wow. always good to, to plan the good stuff. And the bad stuff are not good to plan on. So that's the same as the, the energy crisis that we have in Europe. But maybe it's an after after work topic that we can discuss. I think uh, we are moving into after after, after work, work topics now. So, Rasmus, once again, thank you for being here. It's been a great. So happy to, to finally have come here. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank Thanks. You. Take care.